All right, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry for the slightly late start and thank you so much for joining us today uh, for our community conversation, uh, which is uh, entitled Ensuring Child Wellbeing, the Power of Court-Appointed Special Advocates. And uh, we are hosting uh, this event in honor of CASA Child Advocate Month here in New Jersey. Uh, the state recognizes the great work done by CASA volunteers and the CASA network, uh, and we're here to help trumpet that work. And I'm happy to have with me today uh, Tracy Heisler, who is Executive Director of Court Appointed Special Advocates of Somerset, Hunterdon, and Warren Counties, and also Liza Kirschenbaum, who's the Associate Director of CASA of New Jersey. Just a couple of points before we get started. Uh, this video is being recorded and we are also live streaming to the NASW New Jersey Facebook page. If you have questions uh, for the presenter during the conversation, you can enter them into the chat here in Zoom. Or if you're watching on Facebook, you can add the question to the comment field on Facebook and we will pick it up and transfer it over here into this call. Uh, just a reminder that uh, you did sign a code of conduct, conduct uh, when you uh, signed up to attend this event and uh, just agreed that you will uh, avoid from any crass or inappropriate language uh, in the chat or, or over the uh, audio uh, communications. And uh, other than that, I think we'll, uh, we are ready to begin. So uh, Tracy and Lyle, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having us. I want to know what goes crazy things go on with social workers that you guys need that kind of parameters at the beginning. Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was pretty interesting. <laughs> I didn't think I'd get that with this group, but <laughs> but uh, I, we appreciate the invitation very much. We're we're really grateful to be able to uh, to speak with you about CASA and to answer any questions you might have about you know what we do, how we do it in New Jersey. Um, but we are here to talk about CASA, and that stands for Court Appointed Special Advocates. There is another CASA that operates statewide here in New Jersey, Coalition Against Sexual Assault, and we are often confused. Um, but they're a great organization, and they do great work, too. But we are the Court Appointed Special Advocates. Some of you may already know about us, know, you know, but I'm going to tell you a little more about CASA in general. And then Tracy's going to take over and talk to you a little more about some of our um, current priorities. And, um, and then we'll wrap up with some questions and answers and maybe opportunities for us to work together. So with that, let's see. Uh oh, now how can I advance my slides? Da, da, da. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so um, CASA programs um, across New Jersey advocate for abused and neglected children. These are all kids who've been, currently they're all only kids who've been removed from their homes because of abuse or neglect. There are programs, CASA programs that serve all 21 counties across the state. And what those programs do is they recruit, screen, train, and supervise and coach community volunteers. And those volunteers are appointed by family court judges by orders from the court to advocate for one child or family of children at a time in what we call. So last year um, in New Jersey, there were over six children in what we call out of home placement. These are kids who were removed from Hi, their- Liza, there, there's some kind of um, static that's coming out of your end. I don't know if, if something's uh, smacking a microphone. Okay, is that better? There we go. So um, last year in New Jersey, there were 6,000, over 6,200 children who were living in out of home placement. So these kids are removed from their homes based on allegations of abuse or neglect. Um, the majority of our cases, the majority of cases in New Jersey are really neglect where children are not receiving the care um, that the courts and the child welfare agency think they're entitled to. 
but there are also allegations of physical abuse, sexual abuse, or emotional abuse. And so these kids are removed by the State Child Welfare Agency, which is known as DCP&P, the Division of Child Protection and Permanency. Um, it used to be for old timers like me, we used to call it DIFUS, uh, Division of Youth and Family Services, but the name uh, was changed about, oh, probably 13, 14 years ago now. Um, so they're placed into what we call out of home placement, which includes foster homes, kinship homes, you know, homes with family, relatives or fictive kin, shelters, and sometimes residential facilities. It's important to note that African-American children are disproportionately represented among the children in out-of-home placement. So when I say disproportion, disproportionately represented, there are 14% of, of New Jersey's children are African-American, and yet they comprise about 40% of the state's population of children in out-of-home placement. So that's the disproportionality that I'm talking about. So one of these kids, one of these children was Kendra. Kendra is a real person and I wanna share her story with you, but Kendra is not her real name because we wanna maintain confidentiality of these kids at all times. So Kendra was removed from her home and I'm gonna to refer to my notes because I have, don't have the story memorized. She was removed from her home um, before she was even a year old. Kendra's mom had been in foster care as well but she had aged out without ever being adopted. Um, and she was never reunified with her own family. She abused drugs and all five of her children were removed from her. So I'm gonna weave Kendra's story in and out throughout my presentation on what CASA is and does, cause I kind of feel like it'll give you a better feel for what we do. Um, so you'll hear a little bit about CASA and then a little more about Kendra. So when children are removed from their homes by the state, they not only become part of the child welfare system, but they also become part of the court system. Um, and what we call a children in court case is opened. And the child and their par par caregivers are all appointed attorneys and a court case gets started. Both of those systems, the child welfare system and the judicial system work very hard to help these children. Um, but we have a big issue in New Jersey where court calendars are very clogged and we have a judge shortage. And so what we have is, you know, courts trying to make in-depth inquiries into the lives of children without a whole lot of time to do it. Um, so one good example that I use is the, the County of Camden, where there are nearly 900 children in out-of-home placement and only two judges hearing these cases for 900 different children. Um, these kids also get attorneys, but those attorneys have very large caseloads, up to 100 kids at a time. And while out-of-home placement is supposed to be temporary, we know based on last year's statistics that 30% of children are still in placement after three years. And even if it is really brief and really temporary, these children lose so much. They lose not only their parents, but often their siblings, their grandparents, their friends, their schools. And it's very difficult, especially if they change placements after their first placement, they're suffering these losses again and again and, and losing caregivers, teachers, community as well. So that was certainly the case for Kendra. Kendra was still in out-of-home placement. Now, remember I said she went in before she was a year old. She was still in out-of-home placement at the age of 16. She had lived in 15 different foster homes and had gone to nine different schools. Some of the homes she lived in had been um, regular foster homes, but she had also spent time in group homes and residential facilities. And she was placed briefly in a juvenile detention center, a juvenile shelter, even though she never committed a crime simply because there was not a place available for her. Fortunately for Kendra and for many, many children like her, there was one person who she got 
into her life that was consistently there for her. And that was her CASA volunteer. So I'm going to go into some detail about what CASA volunteers do. But first, I want to tell you how the program kind of how it got its origins, because I think that's important to understanding what we do. The CASA model originated in Seattle, Washington, and was actually the brainchild of a family court judge. Um, this judge, David Sukup, was hearing cases of abuse and neglect, as well as what we call guardianship cases, or cases to terminate a parent's parental rights. And he had very little information, and he was very frustrated by the lack of information the fact that he was being asked to make these really life altering decisions based on an adversarial process where attorneys were, you know, restating very differently the facts in the case and based on very little objective firsthand information. So he conceived of the idea of recruiting and training ordinary community members to do what he couldn't. Like if he could, he would have taken off his robes, gotten off the bench, gone into the community, visited the child in their home, seen what was going on, talked to their teachers, talked to their doctors. So he decided to empower through a court order, CASA volunteers to do this. So by 1979, the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges saw this model that had already begun to spread around the state of Washington. And they said, you know what, we endorse this and we're gonna call it court appointed special advocates. And we're gonna let judges across the country know that they should try to do this as well in order to help them make better decisions for kids. Between 1982 and 1983, the National CASA Association was created and began to spread the model all across the US such that right now we're um, the CASA models in 49 states and there are over 900 local programs like Tracy's um, that are operating across the US. In New Jersey, uh, the first three CASA programs were developed in, in like the mid 80s, 1985, 86 in Union County, Essex County and Morris County. And as these programs grew in their size and in their effectiveness, the two important stakeholders began to take notice. And that was the state judiciary, what we call the AOC or Administrative Office of the Courts, and DHS. At the time, the Department of Human Services housed what was then DIFAS. Now it's Department of Children and Families, and they house dcp and But at the time, in the late 90s, it was Department of Human Services. So they began to take notice. And then in 1999, ASFA, the Adoption and Safe Families Act, was passed. And that act was designed to curtail what... Um, what the professionals at the time were calling foster care drift, where children were just remaining in foster care for years and years and years. And it put very strict deadlines on how quickly a case for a child had to move and how long they could remain in foster care before finding what we call permanence, which is a safe permanent home. So with those deadlines, the courts and DHS were you know, looking for things to help them move not, not just move cases along, but make better decisions. And so they came to the three existing CASA programs and they said, let's start up a steering committee and create a state CASA, CASA of New Jersey, to help us develop new CASA programs across the state and unite CASA's voice, help the existing programs expand. Um, and so by 20, by 2000, we started up CASA of New Jersey, and by 2011, there were CASA programs in each and every county. And as I mentioned before, CASA programs recruit, screen, and train these community volunteers who are appointed by court order to advocate for these kids in out-of-home placement. So these programs and their volunteers, I like to say that they are very much the heart and soul of the CASA program. But what does it mean to advocate for a child's best interests? Because that's what we say we do, right? So first and foremost, we make sure that a child is safe while they're in out-of-home placement, while they're in state care. We make sure that they get their services needs met. 
We make sure that they're in the right kind of placement. We help make sure that they're in the right educational program. So we not only advocate in court for them, but we'll advocate in schools at child study team meetings or IEP meetings, or even just with teachers and guidance counselors. Um, we'll also make sure that they're getting their medical and their mental and their behavioral health needs met. We speak with their counselors, with their doctors, um, because of the nature of the court order appointing us, um, we are able to look at a child's medical records if, you know, in the event that becomes necessary, but also just make sure they're getting their well visits and all the things that a child deserves. We might also advocate for visitation if that's not happening with their biological parents, with their siblings, even with grandparents and other family. Volunteers make sure these kids have what we call placement stability, that they're not bouncing from foster home to foster home. Hopefully that they get into the right, you know, temporary placement at the outset where they can stay and remain and be cared for and loved until their parents are ready and, and able to take care of them again. And then most important, we try to make sure that they get into a safe and permanent home and loving home as quickly as possible. And permanency for these kids means something different for every child. Permanency for, for these kids is as unique as the children themselves, right? So for one child, the CASA volunteer might be working really hard with the biological parents to make sure that they're able to access the services that are gonna help them reunify with their child or access resources in the community so that they can provide for their child's needs. In another case, it might be that the volunteer is working to locate relatives and working with those relatives to be able to make a home for the child. In another case, it could be that the child has special needs and you know, maybe in a pre-adoptive home that is hesitant and the volunteer works with those pre-adoptive parents and helps them overcome the obstacles that might be getting in the way of adoption. And sometimes it's simply facilitating solutions for foster parents, whether it's a relative foster home or a non-relative foster home, just overcoming barriers, identifying what the challenges are, sitting down and communicating and talking to people and facilitating. So CASA volunteers, I like to say, can help in all these ways because we're only appointed, our volunteers are only appointed to one child or family of children at a time. Some volunteers, if they don't have uh, you know, other work or if they have the capability might take on two cases, but it's really the ability to give a child a person that makes us unique. Um, CASA volunteer tends to serve as the eyes and ears of the court, helping judges make the best decisions for the child, helping them figure out what is in the child's best interests um, and helping to facilitate that happening. We conduct fact-finding investigations. We monitor the case to make sure that things are happening the way that they, they should, that things are moving along, that people are complying with court orders and recommendations. We'll make court reports and recommendations as well as community-based advocacy. So when there is a court hearing coming up, the CASA volunteer will draft a report and the report will include all the contacts they've had with the individuals involved in the child's life as well as the child and the facts that they've gleaned from those contacts. And then we will make common sense recommendations based on the facts. We're not experts. While some of our CASA volunteers are social workers and probably more of our CASA staff are social workers, we don't act as experts. Um, the reports that we provide and the recommendations we provide are really their fact-based common sense recommendations to the court about what's in the child's best interest. So fortunately for her, when Kendra was about 14 and a half years old, a judge appointed Leslie as her CASA volunteer. And Leslie is her real name because Leslie allowed us to use her real name. So as you might suspect, it was not easy going. 
uh, for Leslie to be able to break through some of the walls that Kendra had built up after 14 years in foster care. Um, but she found out that Kendra liked to play basketball after school, not with a team or anything. She would just stay in the gym after school and shoot hoops. So Leslie grabbed her sneakers and she joined Kendra. And at first they played in near silence, but then week by week, Kendra began opening up and she started to really share herself. She started to talk about her feelings, her struggles, her concerns, and Leslie quickly became Kendra's trusted person. The person that she reached, reached out to when she was upset, the person that she reached out to when she needed someone to listen or when things went wrong. And things really did go wrong for Kendra, but Leslie was there by her side. So this is pretty typical of our uh, nearly 2000 CASA volunteers across the state. Um, they are the child's voice in court. Um, it's also important to understand that CASA is unique in New Jersey. There is no other organization that's empowered um, to do what we do. There's no other volunteer that provides the kind of one-on-one -on -one um, advocacy and, and monitoring that a CASA volunteer provides, not the kind of one-on-one -on -one attention. So CASA volunteers spend anywhere between five and 25 hours a month in their investigative monitoring, reporting, and advocacy roles. That time is spent really getting to know the child, getting to know all the facts relevant to the child's case, They'll review all of the records and documents in the case. Sometimes that means the DCPMP files and the court files and medical and educational. They work to locate relatives, maybe to identify placements or special services that might be needed by the child. They monitor to make sure that services that are ordered or recommended are actually delivered. They monitor parental progress and they try to facilitate the compliance with court orders, because you might get an order that says, oh, this parent has to go to this kind of therapy, but maybe that's not available in their town or county. And then there's a transportation issue, and then there's a timing issue because the parent has to work. So the volunteer will take a look at the whole situation and try to work to facilitate making it happen and making it work for the family. They'll also seek out community resources to help the child and family. They might monitor the child's health and education if there are special needs there. And they really become that one person. So I like to say, you know, whether it's getting a, a baby into an adoptive home so that they bond and trust or getting a teenager out of a youth shelter and into a family so they understand what family is or getting a mom the housing or services she needs so she can safely parent her children again. Those are the real life things that CASA volunteers do. And Leslie was no exception. Within six months of Leslie becoming her CASA, Kendra had to move out of her foster home because they were denying her the medication she needed. It was Leslie who found out about this um, because Kendra was, you know, Kendra trusted her and Leslie became the one person Kendra would tell about this. So they were withholding her medication, but Leslie knew that you know, Kendra was 15 now, she needed a family. She needed to be in a family because this might be her only chance. So Leslie spent days combing through Kendra's DCPNP case file, looking for any reference to anyone in her life, any relative that might've been there, a coach, someone that, that Kendra had connected with. And lo and behold, Leslie found a reference to an aunt and the aunt hadn't been considered as a caregiver when she was investigated because of a drug arrest. But that investigation and the arrest had happened when Kendra was born, about the same time she was uh, removed from her mother. So that was like 15 years earlier. So Leslie felt it was really important to circle back to this aunt. And she really um, advocated for DCPNP to get on the ball and do that. Um, she herself did some internet searches. She sent around some letters. She had some phone calls with Kendra's aunt. 
she was the one who actually found the aunt because she had moved a couple times since. And as it turned out, she had been drug free um, and a, a productive working adult for years. And she was devastated to learn that Kendra had still been in foster care and had had so many different placements and so many different moves. She thought that Kendra was adopted more than 10 years earlier. So Kendra's aunt really wanted to help her niece but she had some concerns taking in a teenager and Kendra had some medical and educational and emotional issues, as you, as you might imagine. So Leslie stepped in again. She worked very closely with Kendra's aunt to address all of her needs and all of her concerns. She advocated for services for both of them, for visits that would gradually increase to overnights and then weekends. And she facilitated a bond between those two. Because of Leslie's advocacy and all of her efforts, this aunt became Kendra's 16th placement, but her final home. Kendra went to live with her aunt, and within a year, she was adopted. So Casa and Leslie helped break that cycle for this 16-year-old girl. And if it hadn't been for that relationship, it's very likely that the cycle that Kendra's mom had gotten into would have been repeated yet again. So Casa believes that every child deserves, needs to have someone who's committed, committed to ensuring their safety, their well-being, their permanency, making sure that they get into a loving home as quickly as possible, but also just making sure that they have that one person that they trust in and confide in because that makes all the difference. Um, and, you know, so many of these kids, kids in out of home placement, don't have that. The only person there is their CASA volunteer. And so, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy because I've talked way too much already. Oh, look at this. I didn't realize that this was one of these slow builders. I had to figure out how to unmute myself. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you, Liza, um, for sharing that. I had not heard that story before. That was really beautiful. Um, but it is representative of many of the stories that we have around the state of, of things that uh, CASA volunteers have done. I myself started as a volunteer in 1999 and uh, have worked um, dozens of cases with hundreds of kids. And I've seen this pattern over and over of the value of that um, connection and reliability and bond. And the challenge for the CASA volunteer is to be that person, but also somebody who remains objective. So far more of our advocates time is spent talking to the teachers, to the guidance counselors, to the parents, to the resource parents, to the caseworker gathering information to provide to the court while also um, being engaged enough with the child to be that person, but objective enough to be able to provide fact-based recommendations. And it's a challenge. And so we have a significant screening process um, for advocates to find just those right people. So as you can see from the graph in 20, fiscal year 2021, ours runs July 1, through um, June 30th, we had a little over 1,900 CASA volunteers around the state who served um, 3,321 children. Um, 943 of those children achieved permanency um, and, and stayed in their homes. Uh, they're forever families. Our advocates produced 5,225 court reports um, so the way that we do things is our advocates provide the first draft, our professional staff reviews it, helps make corrections, tightens things up, and uh, asks, um, but the, they're not submitted to the court until the volunteer approves. Stephanie's question, do the cost of volunteers main, maintain contact with the child? That's an excellent question, Stephanie. We actually have a statewide policy that came into creation because of one of my volunteers who uh, when the case closed said, I don't care what you say, I'm still gonna have contact with this family after um, my case has closed. 
So Liza and I created a policy um, that has been adopted around the state that says, you know, once the case closes and litigation ends, you should probably should not remain having contact. But if you do, if you choose to do that, anything that happens is on you. And if the child comes back into the system, you can no longer be appointed as their advocate because the objectivity piece has been removed. The relationship has changed. You're now a family friend. So you can you know, be a supporter, but you can't be a CASA for them. And uh, we do have kids that remain um, you know, friends of the program. I was chatting with one this morning, as a matter of fact, who's now 32 years old and, and popped in my office on Friday to visit for an hour. Um, and so, and it really depends. We train our advocates to become close enough to the child that they trust them and that they can help, but far enough away that when the case closes and permanency is achieved, we don't leave a gaping void in their life. And, and it's a hard uh, walk to make. As you can see from um, the graph, our advocates were able to make more than 20,000 recommendations, individualized recommendations on behalf of these children that were accepted 95% of the time by the court. And collectively, our 1,900 advocates donated more than 75,000 hours of service. And that's individual uh, time that these children are getting. They're, because our caseloads are small, we have one family generally at a time, sometimes two, but mostly one. It's, it's highly individualized. So some of the things that um, here in New Jersey, um, we've been able to help with, um, with CASA Every program has their own um, programs that, they're, that they are working and things that they are doing on behalf of the families. But as a network, there's a lot of um, uh, collective effort. So one of the things that um, CASA of New Jersey in particular has been working on is improving awareness about CASA's mission. And that's one of the things that we are really I'm glad to be here to be able to talk about because for the number of children we serve and the good work that we're doing, we're kind of an unknown um, resource in a lot of, of ways. Um, we have a high premium on providing high quality advocacy. We have uh, local, state, and national guidelines that we work under and um, we do a regular quality review process within the network and from national CASA. We, uh, at CASA of New Jersey, they will provide one-on-one -on -one assistance to programs that maybe have leadership changes or have um, economic challenges that are trying to figure out how to operationalize these best practices. And if they need help and support, CASA of New Jersey is there to do that. We also, um, have training programs that we offer throughout the state. One of them that we are just finishing up is ACES Interface. If you're familiar at all with the Office of Resilience and DCF's initiative of training on the ACES Interface model, um, we recently had 28 individuals who went through that program to be an ACE presenter and have gone through the certification process. All but um, three are now completely certified and ready to go. Um, CASA of New Jersey as an entity also works uh, as our liaison for the local programs with the state leadership, statewide, other statewide organizations with the legislature um, to make sure that our needs are addressed from that broader level. Um, CASA of New Jersey is also working to build capacity so that every child in the state who needs an advocate is receiving an advocate. Uh, we have been very fortunate at uh, Somerset, Hunterdon and Warren that we have been serving all of our children for quite some time. And, and I know that many other uh, programs around the state have also achieved that milestone. And CASA of New Jersey is there to support those that perhaps haven't been able to get there yet. Um, one of the things that we are all very focused on as well is making sure that the child's perspective 
is brought into the decision-making process. We know that so many of our kids have their autonomy taken from them when they go into the, the child welfare system. And we try to ensure that their voice is at the table. So one of the other things that I'm really fortunate um, as a local program director to be able to do is to be the chair of the, straight, the state training committee. And it has been our goal to collectively as a network, enhance our advocates um, skills and abilities. We have so much expertise around the state. Um, we've been able to try to, to harness all of that. And that's actually been one of the, the blessings of the pandemic, I guess, is the ability to access platforms like Zoom. Um, because for me to travel to Camden County to do a training on ACEs, it's a whole day thing. But for me to be able to do it via Zoom, it makes the expertise around the network much more accessible. So we're working to make sure that all of the advocates have that advanced skill building. Everybody goes through pre-service training, but um, we hone their skills as the longer they do that. So some of the things that we've been working on, the ACES trainings, as I mentioned, we've created a history of race in the child welfare system a training that we've just started rolling out to staff and we'll be moving in with volunteers. All of our advocates have regular pre-service training as well as medical and educational advocacy. Every month we offer uh, in-service trainings on a variety of topics. Most recently, we've done one on disability rights, on um, the division's pivot to kin placements. In May, we have um, advocating for LGBTQ youth. And in February, we had one on caring for African-American children's hair, which was a thing that a lot of our, our Caucasian advocates didn't know about how to do that. Um, so that's been, that was really interesting. Um, we also have uh, an LMS system, a learning management system of interactive web-based trainings that we've created. And in fact, we're working on one now on advocating for LGBTQ youth. But some of the others that we have include educational advocacy, trauma-informed care advocacy, early childhood development, IEPs, special education, courtroom procedures, opioid addictions. So it's ones that advocates can log into at their convenience, go back and revisit if there was something that maybe they wanted to remember or refine their skills. So it's a really useful tool. Um, we have taken to heart at our, our training committee um, motto that, you know, you do the best you can until you know better. And once you know better, you do better, courtesy of Maya Angelou, because we always we recognize that there's always more that we can be learning. So um, I just wanted to hone in on our, our specific areas of focus right now that we have been doing a deep dive on. As I mentioned, um, we've had a statewide training so that we have uh, facilitators in each program who can um, embed trauma-informed care in their DNA and do trainings internally on adverse childhood experiences. So our focus has been on the four R's of helping people to realize, recognize, respond, and resist, respond appropriately and resist the urge to re-traumatize those who've experienced high ACEs. We also want our volunteers to understand the impacts of intergenerational trauma. You guys know when you pick up a case file and you look at it and you read the allegations and you think these people are terrible. They should never have been able to have children without recognizing um, sometimes from a more experienced level that oftentimes our parents were also victim, child abuse victims and, and experienced high ACEs. So how do we respond in a trauma-informed way to our parents and support their recovery as well as ensuring that our kids are getting what they need? We also want to provide advocates with the tools to understand the difference between capacity and compliance. Because people are sometimes amygdala driven because of their experiences, because their experiences have taught them that they can't trust the system. Um, 
is it a willful, I will not comply with you, or is it a, I cannot comply with you? And so we want them to have a, a, a lot more um, understanding, I guess, of parents. And sometimes from their perspective, it could be really easy to judge. Um, well, if you just quit, you must love your drugs more than you love your kids kind of mentality without understanding what the drugs are masking and how to help heal those wounds. Um, we also are trying to put into operation um, more tools for our advocates of how to build relationships. So in addition to understanding ACEs, we also have within the network facilitators for the nurtured heart approach, um, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. In addition to Connections Matter, uh, which has been coming out from Prevent Child Abuse New Jersey to help uh, build those skills. Um, being trauma-informed also gives our advocates the opportunity to provide the court with um, more trauma-informed recommendations and resources, which can only benefit our children and families. And lastly, we want to help our advocates to understand how to do no harm while they do this work. As I mentioned, I started as a volunteer in 1999, so I'm 23 years in. And I can think of times um, when I did harm because in my ignorance, I didn't know or didn't understand um, what was happening, what, how I could have approached things in a more um, nurturing and, and gentle way than I did. And so we want to ensure that our advocates tread lightly within our families' lives. The next area of focus that we've been spending a lot of time on is the history of race in child welfare. Um, if you're not familiar with the data, um, African-American children in particular represent about 13% of the population here in New Jersey but represent about 40% of the kids in the foster care system. It's a significant over-representation. So one of the things that we've been really focused on is this racial equity. So uh, Liza and I both have been part of a team that has been working with Dr. Um, Carol Spigner about developing a history of race and child welfare training for all staff and volunteers. So some of the things that we have been focusing on is um, recognizing how we got to where we are at and what those implications are for families of color. Like one of the things that I learned in this training was that the child welfare system as we have it today was actually founded and largely shaped by upper middle class white ladies who were distressed at the turn of the century of seeing, you know, uh, dirty poor children running around the streets of New York. So they tried to help where they could, but the, the system that they created was rated, was, was rooted in both racial and class biases. And I don't know that we know that today, that we see the vestiges of that within our system. Through this training, we have also come to understand that white children and children of color have historically received disparate um, support. And we need to ensure that as far as CASA goes, that all of the children that we're serving are receiving the advocacy services that they need specifically, and that we're not filtering things through a race or class lens. Another goal of our training was to help advocates identify places where racial equity is not being served and recommend alternatives to the court because not all of our colleagues are aware of the history of the system. Um, and this kind of training has also, I think, helped um, each of us individually to understand where our own implicit biases um, are and how we can raise awareness about how we can do better as advocates. Um, and, and that's, I'm, and I'm certainly not implying or saying that, you know, in the system, there's a bunch of racist people who are out to get black and brown children. What I am saying is that sometimes stereotypes are deeply embedded in our psyche and we do things without thinking. 
we just automatically make assumptions or recommendations uh, based on, on nothing more than the stereotype within our head in an unthinking way. So we wanna make sure that our advocates are aware of, of the opportunity that they have to do better here. And lastly, um, as with the ACEs, we want our advocates um, to look at their own life experiences and worldviews and recognize that they may not reflect the children and families that we serve. And we don't want them to superimpose their experiences on these families. And understanding the history of the child welfare system and race and class within that can, again, help us to do no harm while we are in this work. So lastly, one of the areas that we've been really focused on this year is um, educating advocates about the needs of children and youth in the LGBTQ population who are also overrepresented in the child welfare system. I saw a statistic the other day that nationally, 30% of the kids in um, foster care are LGBTQ kids. So some of the things that um, we didn't know that we're trying to help people to see um, are some of the statistics about the vulnerability of this population. So these statistics um, came from a CDC study from 2015 and the Trevor Project uh, from a study that they did in 2019. 10% of LGBTQ kids were either threatened or injured with a weapon at school. 34% are bullied at school, 75% for transgender kids. 28% bullied online, 23% experiencing sexual dating violence, 18% physical dating violence or being sexually assaulted, and 140% more likely to not go to school because of safety concerns. That's a huge number, y'all. In addition to the greater risk for depression, suicidal ideologies, and substance use disorders. So we really need to be focused on how we can best support those children and cut through all of the, the politics and cut through all of the stereotypes and instead be focused on how do we protect and serve these children. So one of the other things I wanted to share with you guys was how things have changed a little bit for us at CASA as a result of the pandemic. In our particular program, we have something called the Connie Fund, which is a discretionary fund of, of money that we have set aside for the kids that we've been able to buy things for them that other um, resource parents or the division couldn't or wouldn't provide. So we've had requests for things like summer camp or sports equipment or a, an instrument, things like that. But with the pandemic, the requests that we received changed significantly. And instead of fun things, it moved to things like food, um, to Chromebooks with the, you know, the switch to um, online learning. There were a lot of our kids who didn't have the resources that they needed to do that. So um, we suddenly started shifting significantly to, to what we needed to do to, to take care of them in that moment. So we were not alone. Throughout the state, um, people were seeing this shift to requests um, for, um, for more tangible needs. So as a network around the state, CASA programs provided over $214,000 worth of food, diapers, formula, you know, basic things like that to resource families and to children. Um, since the start of the pandemic, um, we have provided about $130,000 worth of Chromebooks, laptops, and other tech needs. And we've also put in another $140,000 worth collectively of recreational and activity items to keep kids occupied, to give parents a break, to um, try to provide some kind of support um, during the boredom when kids were locked down in particular. We have first night bags that are, um, that, that's what we call them. They're put together for kids when they first come into care and they have toiletry items, they have books, they have games, they have comfort items. And I remember at the beginning of the pandemic of loading up my car with 
50, 60, 70 first night bags and just driving around and dropping them off on people's walkways. So the kids had something a little new. So as our programs around the state have grown and matured, we have found that while advocating for children remains our core mission and, and will, we also have the capacity to grow and, and to be more of a support for families that need us. So some of the things that, that we have found that we can be of use in things like providing for these tangible resources, connecting families to services in a way that it used to be the realm of the caseworker, um, but CASA has been helping to fill that void and support that role as well. We are enhancing our training opportunities, as I mentioned, to ensure that um, all of our kids are receiving quality advocacy services. And we have also, uh, throughout the state, been working with community partners on special initiatives. Um, CASA of Passaic, Hudson, and Morris counties have been partnering together with the courts for a safe babies program. Um, in Somerset, Hunterdon, and Warren, we've developed a traveling tutor program, or we have um, advocates with educational backgrounds who are tra traveling to the children's homes to provide in-home tutoring services. And we are hosting actually later this week, a, an ACEs interface training for our community stakeholders where we uh, were able to get grant funding from disparate sources so that we could provide this training to our colleagues to ensure that we're all working from the same trauma-informed language and understanding. And CASA of Cumberland, Gloucester, Salem, they have created what I think is really awesome. It's called Century Bakery. And it's actually a business that they own as a separate nonprofit. And it is staffed wholly with CASA kids that gives them real world opportunities to learn job skills and to build their resumes and to um, earn money. I think that's brilliant. So as our families' needs change and our children's needs change, so are our programs um, developing and, and changing to serve them and to meet that need. So we wanted to um, open this up for questions, but I wanted to leave this slide up so that if you guys have questions about becoming involved as a CASA volunteer, or if you have a family member who you think that, or friend that you think would be great at this, um, here's the information. There are CASA programs in every um, county here in New Jersey, and we are all very happy um, to help in any way. So any questions that we have? Thank you both so much for the presentation. We do have a couple of minutes left to maybe field uh, a question or two if anybody has. Um, while we're looking to see if anybody wants to come on and speak or if they have anything to put in the chat. Um, so as far as folks getting involved with CASA, um, should they go to the CASA of NJ website to get more information? Is, is that the best way to contact people? Yeah. I think the CASA, you know, www.casafnj.org, um, they'll see, you know, click here to find about, out about a local program. We also have a specific landing page, and I, I can't seem to control my fingers right now. <laughs> we have a specific landing page uh, called, w, it's www casa for children nj and i should have put that on here let me type it the, in the, the, chat. the number four or spelled out the word for it's for casa for children CASA for children nj dot org yeah and that is just a landing page where folks who are interested in becoming a volunteer complete you know like four pieces of information, like first name, last name, email address, and county. And that will automatically generate an email to the correct local program, as well as to the potential volunteer and connect those, uh, that loop. So that is for volunteering as opposed to um, 
as opposed to, you know, learning how to give or become mm -hmm. a board member, that type of thing. Um, for that, they can reach out to me, gossipnj.org, and I'll direct them to their local program. But if they're in the Somerset, Hunterdon, or Warren area, they can reach right out to Tracy. And we are actually recruiting new board members right now. So oh, we nice. would love to see you. So yes. I see I see on the slide, you've got your email addresses and phone numbers there on the slide if anybody wants them. Um, I guess, I don't know if this is gonna be a super long answer because we're just out of time, but just as we wrap up, I'm just wondering, are there any special considerations uh, that social workers who are interested in becoming volunteers need to take into account um, because of their social work and licensing status? Like, is there anything that social workers in particular need to consider? Just to, to recognize that we are advisors to the judge. We are not ones who are taking direct actions or services. We, um, we are connecting with resources. We're informing the court but we aren't the ones who are operationalizing the solutions. And that can be a hard pill sometimes when you know exactly what needs to happen. Yeah, the only other um, consideration would be that if you are a social worker working for a state agency, mm -hmm. you'll have to get the all clear from your state agency to volunteer. But that if, you know, and that's for you know, anyone working in any state agency. Well, thank you both very much. It is one o'clock and I wanna be respectful of, of everyone's time, uh, but thank you so much for being here with us today and for sharing this information. Uh, this is really fantastic. And uh, we'll be putting this uh, video up on our YouTube page and we'll send a copy of the video to everybody who registered for today's event. Uh, and uh, is it okay if we share your slides as well? Of course. Okay. Great, we'll send a follow-up email shortly then. Um, so thank you again so much. And uh, I look forward to continuing to work with you both. Thanks, Jeff, we do too. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.